Hey there, humans! It's time for a science-filled adventure into the icy world of winter roads. Today, we're going to explore the fascinating methods used to clear icy roads, the hazards that come with slippery streets, and the science behind it all. So buckle up and let's get started. Winter is a beautiful season, with its snow-capped landscapes and cozy evenings, but it also brings its fair share of challenges. One of the most significant challenges is dealing with icy roads while driving. Driving on icy roads can be a real nightmare, and it's not just because of the potential for accidents. It's also because of the science behind how ice forms and the methods used to clear ice from the roads. Now first, let's talk about the hazards of ice on the road. When the temperature drops below freezing, any moisture on the road can turn into ice. Now this can happen in a variety of ways, from snow melting and refreezing again, to freezing rain or sleet. Whatever the cause, the result is the same, a slippery, dangerous situation that can lead to traffic accidents. And those of you like me that have experienced slipping on a road when you hit the brakes as hard as you can and you just can't stop, you know how terrifying that can actually be. But why is ice so dangerous anyway? The answer lies in the science of friction. Now, when a car's tire is in contact with the road, there's a certain amount of friction between the surface of the tire and the surface of the road. In physics, this is governed by what we call the coefficient of friction. This friction helps the car to grip the road and maintain control. However, if the forces involved in the driving is greater than the frictional forces holding the car to the road, then of course you can begin to slide. And different surfaces have different frictional coefficients. So for instance, if it's icy outside, you have a very, very low coefficient of friction, so you're going to slip very easily. But if it's a warm summer day and the rubber is a little bit soft and the road is just free of water and ice, then you'll have a higher coefficient of friction, which keeps you planted on the road better when driving. The friction between the tires and the road help the car to grip the road and maintain control. However, when the road is icy, the friction is significantly reduced. This means that the car's tires have less grip on the road, making it harder to control the vehicle and increasing the risk of accidents. Now let's stop for a second and talk about the stopping distances when driving a vehicle. Obviously, if you're driving on a warm summer day, you can slam the brakes harder and come to a stop. And if you're in rain or ice or any other situation, Situation, you may slam the brakes and you may slide. So what is the stopping distance in these different situations? So let's say you're driving a car at highway speeds in dry conditions. Now imagine you're cruising down the highway, the wind is in your hair, and your favorite tune is on the radio. Life is good, but suddenly you need to stop. How far will it take for your car to come to a complete stop? Well, this depends on several factors. It depends on the type of tires you have, the weight of the car, the temperature, how much surface roughness, and the type of the road, and many other things. Very, very importantly, it also depends on your reaction time. But but let's say on average a car is traveling at highway speeds, let's say 60 miles per hour, it will have a total stopping distance of about 240 feet. That's the length of two blue whales, or about 73 meters for our metric friends. Now let's turn our attention to the wet and wild world of rainy roads. So not ice, just rain. When the heavens open up and the roads get slick, the stopping distances can double or even triple depending on the severity of the downpour. So that 240 foot stopping distance we mentioned earlier, it can take a whopping 480 feet or more. Now that's like adding one or two extra blue whales to your stopping distance. But wait, there's more. Let's go from raining to a hard freeze. Now during a hard freeze, the icy roads can turn a simple drive into a scene from ice road truckers. When the roads are covered in ice, the stopping distances can increase by a factor of 10. That means that our 240 foot stopping distance from before can be up to 2,400 feet of stopping distance in ice. 
I'm not sure how many blue whales that adds to our stopping distance, but let's just say it's more than a few. Let's turn our attention and answer the question, are there really more traffic accidents during the winter because of this effect? Let's take a look at the data from the U.S. Department of Transportation. According to their report, there were 30,000 more accidents in winter than in other seasons. Now that's a pretty significant number, but it's not the whole story. You see, winter weather can be extremely treacherous with snow and ice and sleet, making roads slippery and dangerous. In fact, the Department of Transportation estimates that 24% of weather-related accidents happen on snowy, slushy, or icy pavement. Now that is a lot of accidents. But it's not just the weather that contributes to these accidents. There's also the fact that people tend to drive more during the winter holidays, which can lead to more accidents in and of itself. Plus, the shorter days means that there's less daylight for drivers, which can make it harder to see on these treacherous icy roads. So yes, there are more accidents in winter than in other seasons, but it's not just the weather that's to blame. It's a combination of factors that make winter driving a challenge even for the most experienced drivers. The big question is, how do we deal with the ice? There are several methods used to clear icy roads, each with its own pros and cons. Now, one of the most common methods it's called salting the roads. That's when you see the trucks going down the road and throwing the salt out onto the road surface itself. Now, salt actually lowers the freezing point of water, which means that it can prevent ice from forming or it can melt existing ice that's already present. We're gonna talk a lot in just a minute about exactly how that happens. Now, when salt is applied to an icy road, it mixes with the ice and it creates a brine solution on the surface of the road. This brine solution has a lower freezing point than the freezing point of pure water, which means that it can melt the ice and keep the road clear. Now let's stop for a second and talk about the freezing point depression, the changing of the freezing point of water, and explore the reasons behind this happens in the first place because it's a pretty cool phenomenon. Now this is the process where adding a solute, like salt or sugar, to a solvent, in this case water, lowers the freezing point of the solution. In simpler terms, it means that the temperature at which the solution freezes is lower than the freezing point of the pure solvent. So you all know that ice forms at zero degrees Celsius. So let's pretend it's a winter day exactly at zero degrees Celsius outside. So ice would be beginning to form on the surface of the road if there was moisture on the road. It would at that point begin the freezing process. But if you put salt on top of that water, just as the temperature begins to hit zero, now the freezing point of that brine solution is no longer zero Celsius. It's a little bit lower than zero Celsius, maybe two, three degrees below uh, zero Celsius. And so what that means is, since the outside temperature is zero Celsius, but the freezing point of that new solution is a little bit lower, then of course it doesn't freeze and it remains a slush, which is better for traction and gripping and friction than the ice would be on the road. Now let's say instead that the ice was already formed on the surface of the road and it's zero degrees Celsius outside so that ice has just begun to form. As we sprinkle salt on the road, the freezing point of that water is now lower and so that means since it's only zero Celsius, it's no longer cold enough to keep it frozen so the ice begins to melt. Now let's get to the heart of this question. How does this happen? Why does adding salt to ice melt the ice or add salt to the water change the freezing point of the water? To understand this, we need to talk about the molecular structure of water. When you add ice to liquid water, we all know that the ice begins to melt, but what's really going on is the ice is absorbing heat from the surrounding warm water, and so that's why it begins to melt. Now here's the interesting part. As the ice melts, it absorbs heat from the water. This is called the heat of fusion, and it's the energy required to change a substance from its solid form into the liquid form. Now, let's talk about why exactly the freezing point of the solution is different than the freezing point of the pure water. The answer lies in the way that water molecules interact with the solute particles, like the salt, which is dissolved inside. So when you add a solute, such as salt, to water, the particles of the salt get in the way of the water molecules, making it harder for them to form a solid. Now, this means that the freezing point of the solution, in general, is going to be lower than the freezing point of the pure substance, in this case, pure water. 
So it's H2O, so we have the oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms coming off, but it's not a straight molecule, it's bent. And also because oxygen is so good at attracting electrons, the oxygen on every water molecule is a little bit negative in charge. And the hydrogens, which are where the electrons are being stolen from, they are also sharing their electrons, but the hydrogens are a little bit positive. So every water molecule has one half of it, the oxygen half, slightly negative, and the hydrogen half slightly positive. So it's a charged molecule. We call that being polar. And that means that water sort of attracts every other water molecule very slightly, right? And so that's what we get when we talk about surface tension. That's why surface tension happens because of the attraction between the adjacent water molecules. Now what we have at room temperature is a liquid where all of the water molecules are bouncing off of each other and they're just kind of colliding with each other over and over again. Now, as we cool the liquid down, remember half of the water molecule is positive, the other half's negative. As we move, move slower and slower and slower, then the attraction between the water molecules takes over and causes them to stay attached to each other. And we call that the formation of ice when it turns into a solid because it starts to stick together and it doesn't bounce off anymore when the temperature is low enough. But if we dissolve salt, in the water before we freeze it, then the salt is sodium chloride. So sodium ions are floating around the solution, chlorine ions are floating around the solution, and those ions get between the water molecules. So as we cool it down, they are attracted to each other and they try to form ice, but these ions are in the way and so it can't stick so well. What that means is we have to make the temperature of the water a little bit colder than normal to get them to slow down even more and form ice. That is why the freezing point of a salty solution is lower. It's just because these sodium and chloride ions, in this case for salt, gets in the way in between the water molecules. Now salting the roads is really common to deal with ice in winter, but it's not without its drawbacks. For one, it can be harmful to the environment. The salt that we put on the roads can run off into nearby bodies of water where it can harm aquatic life. Of course, some fish can deal with salt water, but some can't, and so that's a problem. It can also damage plants and soil, and it can corrode vehicles and infrastructure. If you're ever not sure about that, go dump a box of salt in your flower garden and you'll see that the plants don't do quite as well. Additionally, salting the roads is only effective at certain temperatures. If the temperature is too low, the salt will not be able to melt the ice, and if it's too high, the salt will be washed away before it can do its job. So that makes sense. If it's 50 degrees below zero or 100 degrees below zero, putting salt will not change things enough to really matter. Because remember, it's just because of the ions getting in the way between the water molecules, but if the temperature is so cold, then even doing that is not going to change the freezing point of ice enough to help us in the winter. Now another method used to clear icy roads is using de-icing agents. Now these are chemical compounds that are applied to the roads to melt the ice. Some of the most common de-icing agents are calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. Notice they're both chlorides, so chlorine is in sodium chloride as well, so that's a commonality between these. These chemicals work by lowering the freezing point of water just like salt. However, they're more effective at lower temperatures and they're less harmful to the environment. In fact, if you fly at an airline and you fly in a very cold environment, they frequently have to de-ice the airplanes. They're not sprinkling salt on the wings. That's not very good for aluminum structures, but they're spraying these de-icing agents, which is usually water mixed with some of these other de-icing agents, which are effective, more effective at lower temperatures. So what else can we do besides salt and these de-icing agents? There are other mechanical methods used to clear icy roads. Snow plows and other heavy equipment are used to remove ice and snow from the roads surface. Now this is a more labor intensive method, but it can be very effective at clearing large amounts of snow and ice in a short amount of time. However, it's not always practical, especially in urban areas where there's not enough space to store the snow and ice that has to be removed. And also these large pieces of equipment need large hangers or warehouses to store them when they're not being used during the warm parts of the year. So there you have it, the science behind ice on the roads and how we use science to clear ice on the roads to make them safer for everybody. It's a fascinating world of chemistry, physics, and engineering all working together to keep our roads safe and clear. So the next time you're driving on a slippery winter road, remember the science behind it. Remember what we've learned in order to keep us all a little bit safer. And be sure to give a nod of thanks to the road crews that work tirelessly to keep our roads safe. 
Until next time, stay curious and keep on exploring the world of science. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.